This should be fun. I have a lot of speaker notes. <laughs> Let's see how much I remember. What I, what I like when I give this talk is uh, when it shows up on YouTube, the inevitable YouTube commenters uh, show up and uh, they, are, they are interesting, especially when they're moon hoaxers. So whenever I mess anything up in a talk about the Apollo project, uh, they believe I'm part of the shadowy cabal that's keeping the truth from you. <laughs> I imagine the shadowy cabal pays well and I'm not part of it. <laughs> is there any possibility that this screen down here, we could see my speaker notes? Is that a thing we can do? No? Okay, this is gonna be cool. <laughs> okay, so it turns out that the Earth and the Moon are pretty far apart. It's about 400,000 kilometers, and in the 1960s, the United States built a big damn rocket to send a spaceship full of people from one to the other. And it turns out that space travel is actually a pretty tricky business. Orbital paths are this narrow balance of accelerations. If you accelerate too little, you miss your goal and you die in space. If you accelerate too much, you miss your goal and you die in space. So you need a computer to help moderate these firings, to help you control your spacecraft. And the guidance control system of a spacecraft must be able to answer three primary questions. Which way is up? Where am I? And where am I going? The Apollo spacecraft had th uh, triply redundant means to answer these questions. The first was the Deep Space Network, which was a globally distributed array of long-range radar stations. And it would just sort of bounce radar off of the spacecraft and let the spacecraft know where it was in universal space. The second was celestial navigation. So the onboard crew would use a telescope built into the craft, a sextant built into the craft, and using mission-timed uh, star charts would measure the angles between well-known stars and be able to triangulate their position in universal space. And the third was inertial guidance. So an inertial measurement unit, which is basically a system of interlocking tops, would measure the deflection of the spacecraft in inertial space to determine where it's changed in that space. And the Apollo guidance computer manages all three of these systems. And in addition, it is the fly-by-wire control system. So it moderates all of the inputs from the astronauts and turns them into mechanical actions. And it also updates all of the displays in the spacecraft, of which there were quite a few. <laughs> so the Apollo spacecraft does this with five interrupts, a two megahertz clock, accepting that all instructions actually take two cycles to execute, 16-bit words, one parity bit, 15 data bits, 2,048 words of RAM, 36K words of ROM, and 17 registers. It weighs 70 pounds, it, draw, it is one cubic foot, it draws 55 watts. It landed men on the moon and it brought them back. So the AGC is a digital computer and it's one of the very early digital computers. Um, it was a research project in effect. Uh, it was one of the first digital computers to use integrated circuits. So these are uh, called flat pack integrated circuits, and they're not really what you would expect uh, nowadays, and they're particularly archaic. Uh, even more archaic, the AGC used core rope memory. So if you're not familiar with core rope memory, uh, it's a diamagnetic ring with a copper wire that goes in or outside of the ring to signal zero or one. Uh, and this has to be hand woven. Come on. Uh, the AGC is one of the very first interactive computers as well. So the astronauts and the computer uh, interact through a thing called the DISCI, which stands for the Display Keyboard. And the DISCI lets the AGC give fast updates to the astronauts. Uh, so you can see that there's a little display here, and the astronauts would know, based on the running program, which is called Noun, uh, how to interpret the display. And the astronauts are also able to run their own programs by inputting it into the DISCI and forcing a noun to run with the appropriate verb. So, you know, what is the computer actually doing back there? So this is a word in the AGC. I've dropped off the parity bit because it's not interesting. Uh, the first three bits, or the last three bits, depending on how you want to look at things, are the opcode. And if you're doing math in your head, that's not many opcodes. You are correct. In certain cases, you can use the next two bits as a quarter code to extend the number of instructions available to you if you don't need to address too much memory. The remaining bits are the address. Now, in the early days of the Apollo guidance computer, when the hardware was designed, when the, the word size was designed, that was enough memory available to address, or that was enough address space to uh, reach into all of the available memory. Then they got more ambitious and they increased the amount of things the AGC had to do, so they had to increase the amount of memory. However, they could not change the word size, so what do they do? They have to start, uh, they have to start banking. And 
if you'll recall, the AGC has two, di two different kinds of memory, erasable and it has fixed. And the fixed is in the core rope and the erasable erasal, bleh, is just in the, the flat packs. So there's a storage flag. And that storage flag tells you if you're going to be using erasable memory or if you're going to be using fixed. If the value of those two bits is zero, zero, it's erasable. Now, because you don't have enough address space to reach in to your addressable memory, you have to bank. So you eat up two bits out of the address, and then you decide which bank you're actually going to reach into. And the interesting one here is 1-1, one, one, which means that you're going to switch. Uh, the fun thing about switching is, let's say you have this address. So you know you're going to be uh, addressing erasable memory. It's going to be switched because it's too far past the address size that you have to work with. You then look up three bits out of a register called the e-bank for the erasable bank. You car crash them over the top of three bits in your word, and then you get your actual physical address. And then you're able to reach into memory. Now, this is also possible to do with fixed memory as well, but the fixed memory size is so much larger that it's significantly more complicated to switch into it. Uh, there's another register called the F-Bank uh, that does the same job, and I won't go into it because it's too complicated. Uh, so the AGC is a, a real-time computer, and it's driven by interrupts. Uh, this is a view of what the AGC is doing in one second. So time one and time two here are the, come on you, are the mission time. Time one fires, uh, if I recall correctly, every 10 milliseconds, and it periodically overflows into time two. Now time two will eventually overflow, but it overflows in a couple of months, so it's past the time that the mission would, would be accomplished. Time three drives the, <laughs> right? <laughs> There's a lot of really fun compromises in the Apollo guidance computer. Uh, time three drives the wait list, and we'll kind of get into what the wait list is, but the wait list is an operating abstraction. Uh, it's not a full operating system, uh, but we'll get into that shortly. Uh, time four, which fires every 20 milliseconds, is T4 rupt, which is what drives the disky. So every 20 milliseconds, the computer has to pull the keyboard to see if the astronauts have actually punched a button on it. Time five is the digital autopilot, the DAP, and it fires between uh, 10 to 120 milliseconds. So the astronauts were capable of telling the computer that I want the spacecraft to hold this heading and do whatever you need to do to make that happen. And that was the digital autopilot that they were interacting with. Now, the digital autopilot has to make very fine scale firings of engines uh, of, of trimming things. So what it has is access to time six. And time six is the fine scale clock. And it has accuracy of one millisecond. So the digital autopilot is able to program the fine scale clock to trigger other things to happen. And uh, times six, times four, and times three are programmable. So you're able to, in software, manipulate the rate of firing of these things. So the Apollo guidance computer is a priority scheduled real-time computer. That's what we would call it now. They didn't have the words for that because this was one of the uh, uh, pioneering projects in this area area. And there are two tables that exist for these sort of priority ordered jobs in the AGC. And the first one uh, is the wait list. Every job that runs in the wait list has to execute in less than four milliseconds. Now, if you kind of think back to the clock and do a little math in your head, that's about 120 instructions that are available to you. So the wait list does very, very low level things uh, in the computer's execution. There are only nine tasks that you can have in the wait list. So anything that you need to do at the very, very low level of the machine, fiddle around with memory, has to fit into that nine task limit. The wait list only has the basic instructions available. So those three bits plus the Q code. So there's not that much you can do. And there's no rescheduling. The wait list is actually uh, in core rote memory, so it's part of the machine itself. Uh, so if you have to change the wait list, you have to build a new computer to do it. And there's no executive. So what actually is the executive? So the AGC software provides two primary operating abstractions. It's very tedious to string together uh, these high-level computations for doing engine firings, for, for uh, doing calculation of your position in inertial space with only a handful of instructions. So 
rather than increase the word size to increase the instruction size, what they did was they added software ab abstraction on the top of it. And the first of those, uh, is the executive, and it provides low-level routines. So now you have the ability to do mathematics. You have the ability to do uh, more complicated store and set instructions. And these aren't true instructions. They're, they're what we would now call functions. Uh, the executive also is responsible for doing system restarts. So if the astronauts trigger a condition where the computer needs to restart, if the computer itself detects that it needs to restart because it's entered a bad state, the executive does that. And it's responsible for serializing all the state uh, necessary to well-known places in low-level memory so that when it restarts, it can pull them back out. The executive also does supervision. So if you have these priority ordered tasks and they go past their time limit, the executive will kill them. Or it will restart the entire computer if it can't do that. Uh, and it keeps the core set. So the core set is a, a programmable uh, task queue. Uh, there are 12 total. Uh, and you're able in software to manipulate the, the job. So you're able to say, based on the mission, that this is what needs to be done. The, the astronauts themselves are able to manipulate the core set, even though they're not aware of it, by inputting different programs. Uh, but there's nothing actually to stop the core set from filling up. By convention, the programmers are only supposed to allow 11. Uh, but if you go past 12, you just have to drop programs off of the bottom. So that's why everything has to be priority ordered. Uh, and that priority ordering means that some things will end up being usurped because you might have something that's really important like firing an engine that uh, usurps something that's less important like updating the display. Uh, the core set is driven by a 20 millisecond interrupt, which is fairly coarse. Uh, so the core set is able to use the fine scale clock to, to perform other functions. Uh, and in the core set, you as the software engineer of the AGC have the ability to use the interpreter. So what's the interpreter? So the native instructions available from the AGC are super primitive. There just aren't that many of them. And in fact, you know, a lot of computers have hardware to deal with uh, invalid instructions. The AGC has no such hardware because there are no, are no invalid instructions. They just used all the available bit space. <laughs> So the AGC word size of 15 data bits actually has insufficient accuracy for space flight. So if you're going to be doing uh, computations in some cases, you don't actually have the ability to uh, uh, represent the numbers that you need. Um, so the interpreter provides very high level routines, provides trigonometry, it provides things that as a programmer you would hope for, and it provides uh, uh, a, a much richer instruction set. So you're still programming an assembly, but now you have the ability to do this very high level thing. Uh, it also provides extra wide words. So the interpreter uses the basic instructions to string two words together so that you can perform uh, effective computations. And as a result of all of this, the interpreter is radically simpler for programming. So if you were to try and program the AGC software in purely uh, basic instructions, it would be possible to do. It would run faster, but the uh, software for the Apollo project was on a deadline. They had nine years, so they weren't able to update the hardware, and they weren't able to really say, eh, we're not, we're not going to make it, we'll ship later. So if you're, if you're actually going to be using the computer, if you're an astronaut and you want to land on the moon, you instruct the computer to perform a capture breaking. The computer calculates its position, it calculates its acceleration, and it calculates how, uh, how much it needs to fire the engine opposite to your acceleration to shrink your orbit and put you into an effective orbit in, uh, in lunar space. So there are actually two computers in the Apollo spacecraft. Uh, one is in the command module, which is on the left-hand side. And there's one person in there, and the other is on the right-hand side. Now, the lunar module computer is absolutely essential to a controlled landing on the moon. It is possible to fly the command module manually. It's extremely tedious, and you can't do anything else, but you can do it. Without the computer and the lunar module, you die. Uh, so the lunar module was one of the... <laughs> the lunar module was one of the first... Uh, fly-by-wire spacecraft. There had been a rocket plane uh, a few years earlier that had been fly-by-wire, but that was about it at this point. So the astronauts, when they decide that it's time to land on the moon, they uh, instruct the computer to execute program 63. And that fires the lunar module engines to begin the descent. And uh, the routine in the AGC source code for program 63 is actually called burn baby. <laughs> 
Here is actually where Apollo 11's core set overflowed. So you'll recall that I said that there were only 12 available. You should never go past 11. The Apollo 11 spacecraft, uh, the lunar module, had a problem where two cables interacted with one another, sending erroneous signals to the computer. Uh, and then the computer was responsible for processing those erroneous signals. And it just filled itself up trying to uh, trying to execute on those, uh, which then caused the computer to restart itself, which is pretty terrifying when you're trying to land on a barren world. So program 64, which the astronauts uh, call up, pitches the spacecraft over. So the astronauts are actually able to look out of the window and see where they're going to land, because the, the uh, Lunar module computer has no ability to detect if it's going to land on a boulder or not. That's the responsibility of the astronauts. All of the lunar modules here had a potentially fatal bug. Um, it turns out that there was a radar to detect if you were close enough to the ground to shut off, of your, shut off your engine. Uh, because of the programming of that radar, if you flew over a crater of a certain shape, you would get the signal that you had landed or were close enough to landing, and it would shut off the engine. Uh, it never did, uh, but it is there. <laughs> And program 66 steadies the thrust vector. So basically, you're landing on a column of fire, and you need that column of fire to keep scaling itself up and down. And it uses a PID vector, or a, excuse me, a PID controller to control this vector. Uh, the fun thing is, the early, <laughs> the early lunar modules actually had a nearly fatal bug in this PID controller. It actually wasn't stable. So if the astronauts had gotten particularly squirrely, they would have caused the PID controller to go out of whack, and then the lunar module would have flipped over onto its side, uh, and then you die. <laughs> but nobody died. Uh, of all of the people that went to the moon, only one crew didn't uh, get to the moon. That was Apollo 13. But it wasn't the computer's fault. It was an oxygen tank that popped. Uh, so you know, the AG what's interesting uh, about the AGC, and, and to me, what's interesting about the AGC is that it was barely possible. This is actually the flight computer for the Saturn V rocket. Uh, it's so large and so heavy that they made the computer a structural element of the rocket. <laughs> No one really, no one really uh, believed that the AGC could ever be dependable. When they started designing it, um, it was an open question whether a, a digital computer could be made to run for more than a few hours at a time, less two weeks that you need to get back and forth to the moon. Um, yet it was. And you know, how did they manage to do that? Well, they compromised a lot. Uh, they, they kept solidifying. Uh, certain tangible gains. OK, well, we've got a basic hardware. Then you would have project management that would roll through and say, by the way, we need more features. So then they would have to sort of cludge it together. So if you actually look at the Apollo guidance computer in the block one, the very first version of the Apollo guidance computer, it's this beautiful, elegant machine. And then by the end, it's this horrible nightmare. Uh, <laughs> and how do you test something like this? Well, you're the US government in the 1960s. The space race is basically the US government and the Soviet Union shotgunning money at the sky. So what you, what you do is you buy a mainframe. You then program uh, a simulator for your computer on that mainframe. You hook that mainframe up to a full-scale replica of the lunar module and the command module. You have the astronauts then run through missions. If the astronauts die because of the bug in the software, they die in simulation instead of in real life. Uh, so that's how they tested it. You know, they did careful and pragmatic and empirical engineering at every step. Uh, there was no hope for elegance because they had nine years. There was no real hope for comprehensive testing. Uh, they just went with it. Um, and what I find really interesting to, about studying the Apollo project is, is the past. You know, all of these techniques that we develop as practitioners informs our present. You know, we're able to, to continually build on, on top of these things. And you know, the techniques that are, were developed for the AGC are in use today. We just don't really source them because they're so fundamental. Any embedded real-time software engineer is intimately familiar at a, at a theoretical level with how the AGC worked. The AGC was a goofy piece of hardware, but its techniques transition uh, right now. And you know, I guarantee you, I guarantee to you that the hardware engineers of the Apollo guidance computer, that the software engineers of the Apollo guidance computer thought that what they were doing was boring. They, they didn't think it was that interesting. They thought the interesting bit was riding on top of the rocket. Um, and you know, the techniques that we develop today in our boring day-to-day -day lives, if we, if we strive for excellence, you know, they're the foundation of the future. And uh, what I would encourage all of you to do in your boring day-to-day -day work is 
is to try to make amazing things. You know, go make hard things. Thank you.